พกส again it is time for another episode of a corrupted poll show I am your host Jay Sizemore and if you hear a little noise like a roaring in the background it's because my AC is freaking running it's like freaking killing me in here um eventually I'll turn this damn thing off because I really can't afford the electric I I can't even afford rent in this place Uh, but uh, anyway, let's get on with the freaking show here. I got a few things to cover. Not much in news because news has been pissing me off, and a lot of things that's been covered in the news lately. Uh, better people have dealt with it and have already weighed in. Uh, I just want uh, this is going to be pretty much an exegesis. This is going to show you how things got this bad, for the most part. And we're going to start it off first with this news out of Canada. This isn't too bad. This is a, this is depending on how you look at it. I guess you could say, um, if you view life as being sacred and this that the other, and if you lean more conservative, you're going to hate this news probably. But if you're more liberal or leftist, this isn't so bad. It's. Uh, it, It's gonna it's gonna be interesting on in how your take is because it does have uh, it, it has some uh, bearing on what we might well where we we expect already in terms of if we ever transition to Medicare for all or not because to a degree to a degree even though we are not a single payer healthcare state as of now to the north. There is a country that is, and uh, they're having a cost problem. Medically assisted deaths could save millions in healthcare uh, spending, says a report from the CBC. Across Canada, the journal calculates that 136.8 million in savings if they just let people die, or not necessarily let them die on their own, but medically assisted. Somebody's going to perform the death watch and ease them, like an undertaker or or or, or Valkyrie, ease them into the next life. Well, the Valkyrie, I guess the uh, the Valkyrie brings the the dead back to a certain extent. Uh, brings back the Ein Harrier. Uh-uh. Uh, bad analogy. And bad analogy there. <laughs> anyway, let's keep going here. New research suggests medically assisted dying. Could result in substantial savings across Canada's health system. Doctor-assisted death could reduce annual healthcare spending across the country by between 34 and a half million and 137 million, uh, according to a report published in the Canadian Medical Association Journal on Monday. The savings exceedingly outweigh the estimated 1.5 to 14.8 million in direct costs associated with implementing medically-assisted dying. The takeaway point. This is a quote from Aaron Trachtenberg, an author of the report and a resident in internal medicine at the University of Calgary in Alberta. The takeaway point is that there may be some upfront costs associated with offering Medicare assisted, uh, medical assisted uh, dying to Canadians, but there may also be a reduction in spending elsewhere in the system, and therefore offering medical assistance in dying to, in dying to Canadians will not cost the healthcare system anything extra. But the cost has to be part of the discussion. The researchers use numbers from the Netherlands and Belgium 
where medically assisted death is legal, combined with Canadian spending data from Ontario. Trachtenberg stresses that uh, means the uh, wait a minute. Trachtenberg stressed that the means to work is theoretical and needs to be readdressed when Canada starts collecting large-scale data at home. After June 17, 2016, when Bill C-14 became law, provinces began rolling out their plans to deal with requests for doctor-assisted death. Manitoba has set up a medical assistance in dying team called MAID. More than 100 patients have contacted MAID, with 24 receiving medically assisted deaths as of uh, January 6th. Trachtenberg said, in a resource-limited healthcare system, anytime we roll out a large intervention, there has to be a certain amount of planning and preparation, and cost has to be part of that discussion. Adding that provinces' differing plans could impact the cost structure of implementation. Uh, it's just the reality of working in a system of finite resources. Now, here's something that's interesting, that, but doesn't surprise me any, considering how Canada is, especially Alberta. Alber Alberta, Canada is the most religious part of Canada. And um, a lot of their faith-based hospitals in Winnipeg and in uh, Calgary and Alberta, um, the, the, the hospital is based on Christian values and, and faith-based uh, faith Christian stuff like that. Religious, religious hospitals have banned medically assisted deaths completely. Now, let's continue on. The report estimated that about 1% to 4% of Canadians will die using physician-assisted death. Of those, 50% will be between the age of 60 and 80. The report estimates a 50-50 split between men and women. About 80% of the patients will have cancer, and 60% will have their lives shortened by one month, while 40% will have their lives shortened by a week. Healthcare costs increase substantially among patients nearing the end of life, Trachtenberg says. Canadians die in hospitals more often than, say, our counterparts in America and Europe, and we have a lack of palliative care services, even though we're trying to improve that. And therefore, people end up spending their final days in the hospital. Hospital-based uh, care costs the health care system more than a comprehensive palliative care system would, uh, where we could help people achieve their goals of dying at home. The report used Manitoba in his example, where 20% of healthcare costs are attributed to, attributable to patients within the six months before they die. Despite their representing only 1% of the population, patients who choose medically assistance in dying may forego this resource intensive period. Uh, whenever we roll out a large-scale intervention, there has to be a discussion around costs, said Trachtenberg. But we do not suggest that costs should ever be considered at an individual level. We are not suggesting that patients or providers consider costs when making this very personal and intimate decision to request or provide medically assistance in dying. The report also emphasized that it is, it, it is only a cost analysis and doesn't include the clinical effects of patients. Uh, patient level research will need to be done before true economic evaluation of medical assistance and dying in terms of cost effectiveness and utility can be done. The report fine, uh, ended. So there's that out of Canada where medically assisted deaths could save billions in healthcare spending. Um, I, I kind of... Uh, well, with me, I'm, I'm not religious. I have no uh, religious values whatsoever. I'm, I, at one time, I, was, uh, I considered myself a nasc nascent Christian, which is the form of Christians that existed right at the time when Jefferson, Franklin, and Priestley and Payne were rolling about, um, and in the first and second century. Because they re re they rediscovered Nascent Christianity from uh, uh, from uh, early writings, 
But um, that, what happened with me uh, renouncing religion and Christianity because was because I couldn't. There's there's no way for me personally to reconcile um, the Old Testament with the New Testament, specifically. Jesus' birth, life, birth, and resurrection, and him being God incarnate with Sodom and Gomorrah's destruction and abortion and gay rights. To me, the entire Bible, every little bit of the Bible, falls apart at the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Completely discredits itself. That's just my personal view. So I have no other, I have no religious values whatsoever. That, that, that conclusion turned me into an apostate, I guess you could say. Um, and I, if I ever got into a situation where I had a stroke and I became a vegetable and or I was in a coma, yeah, pull the fucking plug on my ass. I don't want to sit around and exist. I often consider life itself to be a drag. And sticking around here and being forced, forced to live here in some um guilt and guilt tripped to continue existing here as some kind of prison sentence to me this is purgatory to a degree this is purgatory it doesn't mean i'm gonna as soon as i get off here i'm gonna slip my wrist or take a gun and boom that doesn't mean that i that's not gonna happen anytime soon at least i don't think so i've been driven to that i've been driven to that point before recently yeah but i, I i'm not there yet uh, moving right along, let's talk about jobby jobs. Mm, fucking. <laughs> this is infuriating. I'm just going to play the entire. Fi I'm going to go on mute. I'm going to go on mute first and play this entire five minute video and get something to drink. And then I'm going to go back. <laughs> and replay the video and give you my reactions to this. I want you first to soak this in completely. Okay, go on mute and enjoy the video. The U.S. job market showed steady growth again in August, but hiring slowed from a torrid pace. Employers added 315,000 new jobs last month. It was the 20th straight month of job growth, and there are now 5.8 million more jobs than there were a year ago. The unemployment rate ticked up to 3.7 percent as more people tried to get back into the workforce. But even so, many employers say they still need more work workers. Economics reporter Paul Salman has our report. For concrete pros in northern Ohio, the work for their small crew never stops, rain or shine. Getting business? No problem, says Lori Joyce. They're backed up for months. The work is there. Good. We just need the workers. How many employees could you have at this point if there were people willing to do the jobs? We could get five or six more employees. Yes. More than double the mm -hmm. number of people you have now. Correct. The job crunch is acute almost everywhere. A restaurant industry survey found fully two thirds of its members short on workers. Everybody wants to dine in them, but nobody wants to work in them. Sava Farah had to cut service at two of her three Ann Arbor, Michigan establishments. I was told today that my hosts are making about $38 an hour on average. And you're having trouble filling those jobs. Absolutely. Isn't that something? Now, today's solid job report suggests more people are looking for work, and the unemployment rate ticked up in part as a result, because they haven't yet found any. Economist Anna Elizabeth Kunkel of the job posting site Indeed.com. Today's report shows that the labor market remains strong. We saw strong payroll gains, and while they weren't as strong as July's blockbuster numbers, it's clear that employer demand for workers is still going strong. But employers are still struggling to fill those jobs. More than 11 million job openings during the height of summer. So the big question, why can't employers find enough workers? Among the reasons you've presumably heard before. I don't see a work ethic out there like there used to be. 
That's Lori Joyce in Ohio. In Michigan, restaurant owner Farah agrees. I think hustle is very frowned upon with this younger generation. And that might be amplified by the wave of recent and ongoing government benefits, says Farah. Even the recent student loan reprieve? I think it absolutely takes the pressure off of a lot of college students and people who would otherwise be looking for a weekend job. Of course, there's also still COVID, fewer immigrants, and low pay in high-stress jobs, like the no-benefits $14 an hour Jalen Graham gets to clean planes for American Airlines in Charlotte, North Carolina, having half the time he used to pre-COVID because of understaffing. At, you know, 14, 15 bucks an hour, you, you know, you're not really willing to deal with something like this. So we've heard a bunch of reasons. Uh, COVID, lack of work ethic, uh, fewer immigrants who will take the jobs, low pay, um, government benefits. Uh, is that the full list? So in addition to that, there is uh, the reality of some workers retiring. Earlier in the pandemic, we saw workers 55 to 64 stepping out of the labor force. Again, economist Ann Elizabeth Conkle. There also is the additional reason of uh, care challenges. Um, workers stepping out of the labor force uh, so that they could deal with child care challenges or elder care challenges. Exacerbated by COVID, which has stressed the entire workforce, like his fellow cabin cleaners, says Jalen Graham. We get new hires and then they'll come in for a week or two, kind of see how things go, realize how stressful it is, and they're already looking for another job. And as they drop out, that puts more stress on you to clean up with fewer people? Sir. So it's like a vicious circle. It's about as, as vicious as a hurricane, really. Vicious as a hurricane on the tarmac at the table. The restaurant industry has historically been a challenging place to work, and it's become 10x more challenging. Ann Arbor's Sava Farah. When you don't have the right resources, everybody gets burned, everybody gets hurt, people leave crying, people quit on shift. It's, it's really kind of traumatic, to be honest with you, Paul. So as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking, this is like a labor supply chain crisis. And this was the aha moment for me. After a demand freeze, ships dry docked, planes grounded, restaurants shut, a demand surge, whole industries overwhelmed. And their workers, for the various reasons mentioned, out of the workforce, making the jobs more stressful and thus less attractive than ever to take. For the PBS NewsHour, Paul Salman. Ah, son of a bitch. <laughs> okay. We're going to take this thing and we're going to pick it apart piece by piece. But before I do that, let me pause real quick because I got a I got a cue. So Sorry about that. I got to cue something up that I didn't anticipate uh, when I was in pre-production for this video. Well, let me go grab it and I'll be right back. All right. Let's get into this. But what we're going to do, instead of the video, let's go through the transcript. Because right below here, they do a transcript of the video. So let's look at this, shall we? Judy Woodruff. The U.S. job market showed steady growth again in August, but hiring slowed from a toward place. Employers added 315,000 new jobs last month. It was the 20th straight month of job growth. And there are now 5.8 million more jobs than there were a year ago. The unemployment rate ticked up to 3.7% as more people try to get back into the workforce. But even so, many employers say they still need more workers. Economics reporter Paul Salman has our report. And here's, let's keep going here. Paul Salman for Concrete Pros in Northern Ohio. The work for their small crew never stops rain or shine. Getting business? No problem, says Lloyd Joyce. They're backed up for months. The work is there, she says. Good. We just need the workers, she said. How many employees could you have at this point if there were people willing to do your jobs? Notice the framing. If there were people willing to do the jobs. That's, that's the assumption. Oh, 
They don't say, well, what's your pay rate? What's the perks? What what's the um, what's the uh, fringe benefits? No, the assumption right off the bat, unwilling to work. Nobody's willing to work. Oh, feel sorry for us. She goes, we could get five or six more employees. Yes. There's people. Here's the thing. I let me posit to you something. There are people willing to do the work. Okay. They're not willing to blow 40% of their fucking paycheck traveling to that job, pouring it into their gas tank. Oh, no, man, they're just unwilling to work. Lazy goddamn bums. No, it's lazy fucking thinking. But let's continue on. We could get five or six more employees, yes. That's more than double than the number you have now. Correct. The job crunch is acute almost everywhere. A restaurant industry survey found fully two-thirds of its members, two-thirds of the restaurant industry is short-staffed and short on workers. Saba Farah, the CEO of the Popol Group, says, everybody wants to dine in them, but nobody wants to work in them. Gee, I wonder why. I only wanted, I, I took a job at a Culver's because putting the truck away two days a week would have given me a cardio workout because I was medically told by doctors to lose a hundred fucking pounds. I was not told to get 10 stitches in my hands from trigger fingers. Oh, shit. Hold on. Let me pause. I just accidentally closed that tab. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Whew. Uh, Windows 11 has them rounded corners and stuff around the Xbox. So it's kind of look at that. I mean, right there, if you just click right outside that, it'll close the it'll close the window. Yeesh. Anyway. <sighs> Back to the freaking article here. Paul Salmon says. Salva Farah had to cut services to over three Ann, Ar Ann Arbor, Michigan establishments. Saba says, I was told today that my hosts are making about $38 an hour on average. Ain't no fucking way. They're, they, they might, they, they, there's no... Uh -uh. Hosts and restaurants are making $38 an hour? No. I think what they're doing is they're adding average tips to their already minimum wage and then combining it together, which you can't do because if you work for tips, guess what? You don't have a solid wage. You don't have uh, steady wages. You have what I call shooting gallery wages because you can't guarantee how much you're going to take home in tips or not. I mean, yeah, waiters and waitresses. I started off as a freaking waiter in 89 at a pizza hut making $2.52 an hour. So I was guaranteed, no matter what, I was guaranteed the two fifty two an hour. But I took home maybe 10 or $15 in tips every night, and that's it. Sometimes up to 30. And I was 14. And I still went to school, for crying out loud. $38 an hour? My ass. My ass. Not in this economy. Not with this inflation. That can't be a 30... I mean, shit. I, I'm sorry. I don't buy it. It doesn't pass the smell test. And I've been working fast food restaurants and retail all my freaking life. And, and ran a computer business since uh, 88. From 88 all the way up to 2003. There's no way. This is garbage. This bullshit by sheer mass. And you're having trouble filling those jobs? Absolutely. Isn't that something? Now, 
Today's well, another reason why they're having trouble filling those jobs is daycare. God damn, man. People that were working those jobs before the pandemic and then got to sit at home during the lockdown with their freaking kids, they realized what they missed. Okay, some of these people, some of those people that were on lockdowns were in the wrestling industry and in the music industry, were they on tour 300 days a year? Guess what they missed during those 300 days a year? They missed their child speaking for the first time. They missed their child walking and taking their first steps. They missed a fucking lot. And when they went home and sat, uh, sat down and didn't have any work to go to during the lockdowns, shit happens. Reorganization and rethinking happens. Oops. And, and it, it's ridiculous how the article only pays attention. Doesn't even mention that at all. They only focus on one thing and one thing only. Let's continue on. Now, today's solid job report suggests more people are looking for work and the unemployment rate ticked up in part as a result. They don't mention how many people, they don't mention the U6 unemployment rate. They don't mention the labor participation rate at all. They only mention the cooked and ronned figures. Of course, because they take that they are. This is an this is a media organization. PBS gets their news. Their news is produced from NBC. And it's been like that. They outsource. They've been they've been outsourcing their media to NBC since to George uh, since George W. Bush was president when he let him do it. He signed off on it. So now we have we now have corporate media in our public broadcasting. Now let's continue on. I'm telling you, this is pissing me off and I'm fired up. Now, let's, let's see. Now, today's solid job report suggests more people are looking for work and the unemployment rate ticked up and apart as a result because they haven't found it any yet. Uh, economist Anne Elizabeth Conkle of the job posting site Indeed.com. Um, today's report shows that the labor market remains strong. We saw strong payroll gains. And while they weren't as strong as July's blockbuster numbers, it's clear that employer demand for workers is still going strong. But employers are still struggling to fill these jobs. More than 11 million job openings during the height of summer. So the big question, why can't employers find enough workers? Among the reasons you presumably heard before, Lori Joyce. I don't see a work ethic out there like there used to be. Gee, I wonder why. When you got a toxic boss, when you got a toxic job... You're going to quiet quit. And the sad thing is the quiet quitting term is a modern term for something I used to be my generation. I'm pushing fucking 50. What we what is now called quiet quitting used to be called in a union shop work to rule. That means you work according to the rules in the contract. And when it's time to leave, you bug out. Whether the work is done or not, you bug out. According with the union back into the union days, and uh, it's hard to articulate this when so many thoughts are running in my head at the same time, fighting for control of my tongue. But this is the truth that we all know. These two soup bones. These are your money makers. Okay. This is your, these two hands are your only leverage, that and your wallet and your feet. So, under the old school labor union paradigm of thought, you and I lease our feet and our two soup bones, our two hands. We lease our time and labor in a block. And that's it. We're only willing to do that. Anything beyond that encroaches encroaches on other things that we have we might find are more valuable such as say it, we call it the work-life balance nowadays 
And back in those days when unions were strong, our belief and labor's belief was if the work can't get done in an 8 to 10 to 12 hour day, depending on the union contract, if the labor can't get done, then it's not getting done. Tough. It just has to roll on to the next shift and then the next shift and then the next shift. But that's not that's not how it is anymore. When Reagan weakened when Reagan weakened the unions, along with not just Reagan too, George W. Bush, uh, George Bush uh, Sr., Poppy Bush did it, Clinton and Obama both did it, all of them. We've had fifty freaking years of politicians weakening union uh, union la uh, unionized labor, just weakening and, and, and gutting it completely, and as a result. More overtime and more production and no more benefits. We're losing out on it. And there's a reason why, and I'm going to get to that. But I like, don't you say, there's just not a work ethic out there there used to be. <laughs> Gee, I wonder why. That's Lori Joyce in Ohio. In Michigan, restaurant owner Farah agrees. I think hustle is very frowned upon with this younger generation. It's not a hustle. It's this. That's it. We're only we, we have about yeah, labor has finally put its foot down and say enough's enough. We are only going to work these specific jobs or and or these specific block of time. We're only leasing you and we you we oh, you only rent us for that block of time. And if you don't like it, tough. You don't deserve an employee. You're not entitled to an employee. And they're belly aching. They like the. This is the generation. These are the people like to say that the younger generation are the entitled ones. But look at all the entitlement inculcated, and their crapola they're spewing. This is this is like uh, hanging out on LinkedIn, and watching all the boomer bosses bitch and moan and piss and moan and whine and complain. If you ever hang out on LinkedIn, it's like a meme at this point with the boomer bosses. It is horrendous. <laughs> there is a YouTuber out there by the name of uh, Josh. Um, oh, hell, let me pull him up here real quick. <laughs> but he 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 uh, he bashes on this a lot, he, especially Indeed. Let me see if I can find his name here. But it's um, do do do. Josh Fluke. Joshua Fluke. Check his channel out. Uh, I'll put a link in it, but he really beats down on uh, the... Uh, he really comes down hard on the uh, boomer boss mentality that's so much a part of this stuff here as well as uh, LinkedIn. But it's hustle. <laughs> gumption how many more buzz phrases can you throw in here guys and paul Salmon says and that might be amplified by the wave of recent and ongoing government benefits says para even the recent student loan reprieve i think it absolutely takes the pressure off a lot of college students and people who would otherwise be looking for a weekend job see they are of this mentality that some of these jobs, these very jobs, are only for certain segments of the people. Them job of the jobs is not meant to be a career. Well, explain the replication, guys. Explain the replication. Here, let me look. At, let me show you uh, the, the the southeastern Michigan here. You got uh, you got uh, Wayne County, which is part of Detroit. You got Ann Arbor. You got Monroe, and you got Lenaway. Them jobity jobs not meant to be a career. Explain this. This is one. I'm going to zoom right in on Telegraph here. US 24. We're going to show a bunch of these jobity jobs, aren't we? Oh, that's a little too far north. That's uh, if Flat Rock. Now, here we go. Here's the lows and staples. Let's zoom in some more. Look at that right there. They just. Boom! Popcorn right in the view. Look at this. 
Look at all this replication. Harbor Freight, McDonald's, Tim Hortons, Take 5, Culver's, Meyer. Let's keep going south. You know, explain it. They never explain it. Them jobbity jobs are not meant to be a career. Explain the fucking replication then. Why are there careers devoted to developing them and putting them out there? Oh, well, 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 well that's the owner. <laughs> He's entitled. Uh, yeah, we get that. Yeah, he's entitled. <laughs> Imagine that. I like how that uh, how that plays out. It's okay when the all, when the owner and the people with the money, you know, the great and glorious and gossamer job creator, comes out with his benevolent wallet and beseeches us, <laughs> it's like manna dripping, dripping off the mountainside. Right. But I want to say something else, okay? There's so much replication in these jobs that nobody wants. But they're only for college students? For the weekend job? <laughs> what about people like me, man? They got destroyed. Now wiped out. I'm still, I, I still don't have any much, this is still rock hard. I don't have much mobility in this damn hand anymore. I, 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 I can't afford to go back to fast food again, considering what fast food did to me and the toxic managers did to me. But, it, you know, the toxic managers, that's one person out of seven goddamn billion on this planet. How the hell can he be toxic unless he had enablers and rewarders? People who will clap their fins and march along as long as they get a, a manager tag and a tie and get to boss people around. They want, they want the titles. They want the power. But they shirk. They shirk the responsibilities. One of the common things in fast food is when you call off they, they, tell you, they try to tell you that you're responsible for finding your own goddamn coverage. <laughs> it's like that. I had the same problem at fucking Colors, man. I would open up the GroupMe app, and I only called up, I think, one or two times. Other than having to be off of work for, well, that's it. Like, one or two times is all I called up in six months and two days. But so many other people called up. All these teeny boppers, all these children they want for all these children, all these children they want for the weekend job of these jobs. All these motherfuckers keep calling up. And uh, or they, they got mom and dad. They still live at home because they sure as hell can't fucking live on their own. I'm 48. I can't live on my own. You financed my rent. People like you did. You remember that? It was only a month ago. Fuck. And if they call off, what are they told? You have to call around and get your shift, uh, you get your shift covered. Otherwise, it's going to count against you. What that means is they want you, the manager at that Culver's, at that McDonald's, at that freaking goddamn pizza shop, at these restaurants. What they're telling you is their policy is that if you call off, you have to find your own coverage. Now, the managers, the managers make the schedule. But guess what? When you call off, what happens? Boom! A hole gets created. You get a crater. Get a big goddamn hole in that schedule. Well, my theory and my belief is if you make the schedules, your job is to fill those holes. That's why they pay you the big bucks. That's why they give you the tie and the tag and the managerial powers and stuff. That's why they pay you that job. But no, they created this idea, this rule that people who call off have to find their own coverage 
so that managers don't have to do it because the managers are paid 18, 15 to 18 dollars an hour maybe some maybe four let's say between 14 and 18 dollars an hour and the lowly crew gets 13 or 12 12 or 13 dollars an hour Bug. When you're the owner of the establishment, you're going to you're going to make this cocky mamey excuse where my managers are worth more per dollar per labor and shouldn't be stuck in the office filling up holes on that schedule for me. Everybody call it off. Hey, Corky, it's the job. Don't want it. Leave it. And notice the unspoken reality there. Notice the unspoken deep dark secret. When you, you have to find your own coverage for the, your own ship that you called off, guess what you're doing? You're working off the clock. This policy is wage theft. A policy where you have to find your own coverage instead of the manager for your call off is wage theft because they don't have to pay you to scroll through your phone and all that. They don't have to pay you for that time. This is why Meyer and Walmart got in trouble because they once had that law in retail in the mid-90s and early late 90s. And then when people started suing and quitting in droves, the reckoning happened. And then the federal government started looking over and pouring over Walmart and going through all these, all, all, the, all the books and noticing a sick trend. A really constant, write it on the calendar sick trend of wage theft, where people worked off the clock or were expected and guilt tripped into working off the clock because of a policy said so. But there was a lot, this, there's this thing called laws, okay? Laws, not to be confused with your mood swing, state that. We are to be paid for our labor. We're not to work off the clock. So guess what happens? Guess what happens when the McDonald's and the Burger King and the Wendy's and the Culver's manager comes up to you or puts it in their little group me chat that you have to find your own coverage for your own call off. You just lost fucking money. You were working off the clock. And if you was to raise a stink about it and speak up about it, you are creating drama. We're going to take you off the schedule for comments and citing drama. It's called breaking the law, you shitbags. <laughs> you can spin it how you want. Drama. People are people should get be paid for their work. They shouldn't have to work off the clock. And when they push back on it, that you shouldn't be firing them or taking them off the schedule or otherwise committing what the EEOC calls. And let's go ahead and type this in here: EEOC illegal practices. What they shouldn't be doing is engaging in constructive discharge, forced to quit. Discriminatory practices under the EEOC enforces uh, forcing an employer to resign by making the work environment so intolerable that a reasonable, be a reasonable person would be unable to stay. Wage step does that. Most certainly does. Uh, unrealistic stocking standards, unrealistic expectations does that. Where you needle and poke and 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 and, and Work your thumb and keep on pounding on that employee until they rage quit. That's how that happens. 
And the sad thing is, is these people in these jobs, these managers, these owners of fast food and restaurant and hospitality too, hospitality hospitals and stuff, they use all this. They engage in this willfully and knowingly to stop you from collecting unemployment. Because if you rage quit, even though it's constructive discharge, you're not going to be able to come. Come. You're not going to be able to uh, collect your unemployment unless you can prove it. Which is why you have to go through the EEOC and file their complaints and get the paper and get the charge of discrimination and whatever. You have to go through this rigmarole just to be just to qualify for the unemployment. And and people like Sarah, people like Sarah think people are going to just. Beat the street clamoring for these jobs? Like the college students looking for a weekend to work? Uh-uh. They're better off elsewhere. They're better off gigging, for fuck's sake. At least they were. Before Biden signed Biden and Congress and those idiots signed that law where you where, where they're gonna track your six hundred dollar deposits now. Of course, there's still awful. Uh, there's still COVID. Fewer immigrants. See right there. They're saying the quali quiet part out loud. Immigrant labor and low pay, high stress jobs. There you go. Like the no benefits, fourteen dollar an hour. Uh, Jalen Graham gets to clean planes for American Airlines in Charlotte. All oh, but flipping butter burgers isn't high stress. Yeah, dealing with pissed off call, uh, uh, pissed off customers at the drive-through isn't is, isn't stressed. Come on. But he goes on at fourteen to fifteen bucks an hour. You know, they're not really they're, they're, you're not really willing to deal with this something like this. He's right. I mean, yeah, the wages are one part of the problem, but they're not indicative of the entire problem. Another part of the problem, and let's uh, close that. Is, let's go back to my map here. Let's scale out. What, what these boomer bosses and the boomer mentality bosses don't do is they don't look at the grand scope of things they don't look at say detroit and ann arbor say if you're if you're a burger man if you're a burgermeister in the middle of monroe county people okay you got bob's burgers and you just opened up what you're not doing and what what most of these bosses don't freaking do is they don't look at detroit and ann arbor and dundee and monroe and uh, and, and 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 adrian and all these surrounding areas and ruminate on whether or not they're going to be able to attract people to commute to work to that job. How many people are going to go from, how many people are going to leave their cushy home and, you know, in Ypsilanti to work in Carlton? How many people are willing to leave Milan to go work for flat, or work in Flat Rock, even though it is a straight shot down uh, Sumter Road? Yeah. You know? How many people are willing to travel from Petersburg all the way up to Romulus to work? Your, your labor pool is finite. And when you're going to be toxic and, and demanding and entitled and... <laughs> when you're going to be all like that, when you're going to be childish, let's just call it like it is. When you're going to be narcissistic toxic and childish in your expectations you're going to come to a point where hey wow i just chewed through the available labor pool in six months eight months what am i gonna i got no people filing applications what the hell happened here that's because you're meant you're, 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 you mentally think that people are just clamoring you've got that uh, mentality from uh the field of dreams where if you build it, they will come. Not going to happen. It's not realistic. Just because you build it doesn't mean they're going to come and keep coming. When you chew through, when you chew through 
80% of your labor pool within six to eight months to the point now you're belly aching in your Fruit Loops, in your Thundercat Adderall's, uh, the people don't want to work. Who's the who's the blame for that? Probably the nearest mirror. Because you had this mentality where labor was like a game shark code you program into your like a cheat code you program into your PlayStation Two, and you get to win. You get to beat the game. Whoops. Hey, listen here, Corky. Real life doesn't work that way. That's not how this works. You got to be realistic and say, hey, when the price of gas is X and the people live in Y, Z probably isn't going to happen. You know? doesn't take rocket scientists. It just takes freaking logic and common sense. Speaking of common sense and logic, here's one right here. So we've heard a bunch of reasons. COVID, lack of worth ethic, fewer immigrants will take the jobs, low pay, government benefits. Is that the full list? So in addition to that, there is this reality of some workers retiring Earlier in the pandemic, we saw workers 55 to 64 stepping out of the labor force. Well, guess what, kiddos? When you give somebody who only wanted to lose 100 pounds medically so he could uh, maybe stop being a diabetic and be in better health and ends up with 10 stitches in his fucking hand, you know, you're pretty much, you're pretty much forcing that motherfucker into retirement. There was, I had no workman's comp. I had nothing. I had to rely on you. I had to rely on Savvy Sabs and donations and charity to make rent. Speaking of rich, rent is due again. This is September 3rd. I got to pay rent by, by the 5th. I'm out and I'm, I, I've, I've done everything I can. I <laughs> fucking God. I am on, I am on Indeed and Glassdoor and anywhere, um, uh, all these online job places, I've been, <laughs> I've been submitting my resume. I've been applying to everything from sundown to sunset or sun up to sunset. And I'm getting a lot of freaking, uh, I'm getting gaslit. I'm getting ghosted again. And it sucks. I haven't gotten an interview two months. Okay. I haven't worked for, it's been almost, two, it's been a little over two months since I left Culver's. And I started putting out applications a month. As, as soon as my surgery was done, as soon as I came home from surgery and I slept it off, I had to sleep off the, uh, um, the anesthesia with my cast on my hand for fuck's sake. I went against my doctor's orders to stop working uh, and stop using mice and pencils and keyboards and such. And I started trying to find work. Nothing. People are applying for these jobs, I bet. And they're getting ghosted. Some of these jobs could be fake and fraudulent. Did you know that? I'll sh let me show you here. Let me let me look at. Let me pull it up in real time. Let's go jobs near me right on Google here, and we can pull this sucker up. Plus a hundred more jobs. Let's look at this right here. Papa Paul, uh, five and below, uh, Pizza Hut, uh, Yang Feng, groceries and, and Instacart, Bath and Body Works, GameStop, A and W. Um, Warehouse selector, morning sitter, crew members in Wendy's, of course. Um, superintendent, uh, third shift stocking clerks at, uh, at Meyer, uh, TNA. There's a lot of you know. There's jobs out here, of course. They're 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 advertising them right here. But here's the thing that people don't fucking realize: some of these could be fake. Some of these could be totally fraudulent. For example, let me show you one here if I can. 
let's let's look at this one the nurse practitioner okay at united health group they could already have this position filled they could be looking to fire their current nurse practitioner <coughs> And they're advertising for the potential opening so that that the nurse practitioner they want to fire and get rid of can train his his or her own replacement. It doesn't have to be real. It doesn't have to be legit because the laws, the laws regarding false advertising only apply to point of sales. That is, when you buy something. Companies, employers are free and clear to unfurl now hiring banners everywhere and anywhere when they're under a hiring freeze. Or there's no jobs at all. They're free and clear to do that. And they don't break any laws doing it. Let me show you my maps here. Let me go back to Google Maps real quick. Let me scroll up and let me show you something. Now, you know this is Michigan. So if you look, Mi Michigan, this is facing east. So all the, uh, all the places, all the places along Telegraph Road here in Michigan that are along Telegraph Road that face the east, let's, t let's take a uh, Home Depot here, right here in... Um, along Eureka Road in, uh, just off of, uh, in, in downtown Detroit here in Romulus, I guess you'd say. 2100 Penn Street is where this place is, Home Depot. Actually, it looks like it faces south, so let's pick something else up. Uh, that's I-75. Let's go back to 23, U.S. 24. All right, look at all these places on the left side of the street. Yeah, all right, let me scroll down here. If they, if they, if the place, if they face east, what happens is, and I'll, I'll let me show you with, uh, let's see if I can find Lowe's here. Because there is a Lowe's here locally. Yep, US 24. Here we go. Let's go, I just seen it here, Steiner. Now, Margo's Garden Center, Ollie's right here. Lowe's here, okay? This Lowe's here, their building faces east. So what happens is if you have a building, if your employer, if their facilities either face east or west, what'll happen is if they unfurl a now, now hiring banner, guess what? They have to replace that banner every six months because the sunrise or the sunset will bleach it invisible, bleach it clean. They don't have to be hiring, though. They don't actually have to have jobs available. And they can falsely advertise. They can make you... Blow your goddamn gasoline, chasing them, chasing these phantom jobs. And there's no recourse for you. That's why that's another reason why these jobs are being unfulfilled. There's no guarantee you're going to get them. It's shitty. It's shitty work. The, 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 there's no perks. There's no work. There's no PTO or anything of the darn sort. And the sheer amount, of, you lose money. You lose so much money pouring gas into your gas tank at $4 a gallon to chase a job that's $14 to $15 an hour, and you're going to get ghosted? It's not worth it. It's not, it, it's not, sound, it's not economically sound. And these people here are clueless. These well-heeled, well-heeled, six-figure collecting, upper-middle-class, privileged fuckers don't see that. Not Elizabeth Conkle, not Paul Solomon, none of them. 
The only the people they interview, yeah. But they they make six figures a fucking they make six figures a year. What the hell? How much are you? I mean, if you make six figures a year, how much money and how much in gasoline are you going to pour into your gas tank to go looking for a freaking job? Elder, right here, it's another one. There's also an additional reason of care challenges. Workers stepping out of labor force so that they can deal with child care challenges or taking care of an, uh, uh, of an uncle who's been ruined. Taking care of a freaking uh, brother or sister. Uh, people that are aging. The boomers are dying off, folks. Exacerbated at COVID which has stressed the entire workforce like his fellow cabin cleaners, say Jalen Graham. He, where he said, we get new hires and they'll come in for a week or two, kind of see how things go, realize how stressful it is, and they're already looking for another job. And that goes ditto if your boss or the owner is toxic, your managers are toxic. They've got the boomer mentality. They, they've got the same mentality here. And as they drop out, that puts more stress on you to clean up with fewer people. Yep, sure does. It's like a vicious cycle. It's about as, as vicious as a hurricane, really. Vicious as a hurricane on the tarmac at the table. And right here, the restaurant industry has a story, has a history. See, right here, they, they say the quiet part out loud again. The restaurant industry has historically been a challenging place to work, and it's become 10x, 10 times more challenging. Gee, I wonder why. This is an industry that never had unionization. Unlike retail, unlike grocery, at one point in time, at one time, at one point in time, re, uh, fast food was the only industry not unionized. And 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 be and, and, and a paper route, and, and selling ice cream bars, stuff like that in the fifties and sixties and seventies. Now there's no unionization whatsoever in these industries, or barely any. Walmart's not a union shop. Lowe's isn't. Meyer is. At least in Michigan, most of them are. Most of the Meyer in Michigan are. I don't know about Indiana and Ohio or Kentucky. When you don't have the right service, when you don't have the right resources, everybody gets burned. Everybody's getting burned because of the capitalist system. It ain't about the fucking resources. The resources are the distraction. It's about the capitalist wage slave plantation. And I'm going to say it. Everybody gets hurt. People leave crying. People quit on shift. People get 10 stitches in their fucking hand. Really kind of traumatic to be honest with you. It is. So as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking this is like a labor supply chain crisis. It's a crisis in capitalism. It's a crisis in the system. We have learned over the course of this pandemic that capitalism cannot deal with a pandemic. Capitalism cannot deal. Can, that has, it has nothing it cannot, it is a system bereft of any plan of action for shutdowns and lockdowns. It just doesn't, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't care. Capitalism just wants one thing and one other thing only. Capital. More greed, more cash, more money. Damn, uh, damn the ethics. Ethics be damned. Morals be damned. And that was the end. Here's the thing. That was the aha moment for everyone. As the demand freeze, ships dry docked, planes grounded, restaurants shut, and a demand surge, whole industries overwhelmed, and their workers, for the various reasons mentioned, out of the workforce, making the jobs more stressful and thus less attractive than ever to take.
And you've got, uh, you got uh, shows on Hulu like The Bear who are showing what it's like. You know, this industry had a reckoning. And now, it, it, now it's, dealing, it's, it's dealing with that reckoning. And why has that reckoning happened? What brought us to this? Boy, this is a long show. I hope you're ready to stick around for another half hour and 45 minutes. Because we're going to meet the hidden architect behind America's racist and classist capitalist economic system. As soon as I take a drink. Huh, you thought I was going to say, and after our sponsor. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not Linus. But anyway, I'll be right back. All right, let's rock and roll here. All right. Oh, I uh, grabbed me a little some crackers and munched them real quick. Good old crackers and cheese. And now I'm ready to finish this uh, show off here. Get this uh, thing rolling. Because uh, we're, we're on the back nine now. We're going to talk about the, mid the hidden racist uh, architect of this system, folks. <sighs> now, <laughs> notice the date on this article. May 30th, 2018. This is 2022. That's This is four years ago. I'm going to read you the whole thing, folks. I'm going through this whole fucking article. Let's get right to it. Ask people... Let me see. Let me shorten down. Well, wow, that is 100%. Yeah, that'll do it. Let's go 90% on the text here. That way it's a little bit more, it's easier in the eyes for me. Um, Nobel laureate James Buchanan is the intellectual linchpin of the Koch-funded attacks on democratic institutions, argues Duke historian Nancy McLean. Ask people to name the key minds that have shaped America's burst of radical right-wing attacks on working conditions, consumer rights, and public services... And they will typically mention figures like free market champion Milton Friedman, libertarian guru Ayn Rand, and lace fair economists Frederick Hayek and Ludwig von Mises. James McGill Buchanan is a name you will rarely hear unless you've taken several classes in economics. And if the Tennessee-born Nobel laureate wasn't uh, were alive today, it would suit him just fine that most well-informed journalists, liberal politicians, and even many economic students have little understanding of his work. The reason? Duke historian Nancy McLean contends that his philosophy is so stark that even libertarian acolytes are only introduced to it after they accepted the relatively sunny perspective of Ayn Rand. Yes, you heard that correctly. And how destructively is his vision in manifesting under their noses? It would dawn on them how close the country is to a transformation most would not even want to imagine, much less accept. This is a dangerous blind spot. McLean argues in a meticulously researched book, Democracy in Chains, a finalist for the National Book Award in nonfiction. While Americans grapple with Donald Trump's chaotic presidency, we may be missing the key to changes that are taking place far beyond the level of mere politics. Once these changes are locked in place, and remember, folks, this was four fucking years ago. Once these changes are locked into place, there may be no going back. And why am I getting notifications while I'm on Do Not Disturb? What the hell's up with that? Anyway. McLean's book reads like an intellectual detective story. In 2010, she moved to North Carolina, where a Tea Party-dominated Republican Party got control of both houses of the state legislature and began pushing through a radical program to suppress voter rights, decimate public services, and slashed taxes on the wealthy that shocked a state long on the beacon 
of Southern moderation. Up to this point, the figure of James Buchanan flickered in her peripheral vision, but as she began to study his work closely, the events in North Carolina and also Wisconsin, where Governor Scott Walker was leading assaults on collective bargaining rights, shifted her focus. Could it be that this relatively obscure economist distinctive thought was being put forcibly into action in real time? McLean could not gain access to Buchanan's papers to test her hypothesis until after his death in 2013. That year, just as the government was being shut down by Ted Cruz and company, she traveled to George Mason University in Virginia, where the Economist papers lay willy-nilly across the offices of a building now abandoned by the Koch-funded facility of, of Koch-funded faculty to a new fancier center uh, in uh, Arlington. McLean was stunned. The archive of the man who had sought to stay under the radar had been left totally unsorted and unguarded. The historian plunged in, and she read through boxes of drawers full of papers that included personal correspondence between Buchanan and billionaire industrialist Charles Koch. That's when she had an amazing realization. Here was the intellectual linchpin of a stealth revolution currently in progress. Buchanan a 1940 graduate of Middle Tennessee State University, who later attended the University of Chicago for graduate study, started out as a conventional public finance economist. But he grew frustrated with the way in which economic theorists ignored the political process. Buchanan began working on a description of power that started out as a critique on how institutions functioned in the relatively liberal 1950s and 60s a time when economic, economist John Maynard Keynes' ideas about the need for government intervention in markets to protect people from laws so clearly demonstrated in the Great Depression held sway. Buchanan, McLean notes, was incensed at what he saw as a move towards so socialism and deeply suspicious of any form of state action that channels resources to the public. Why should the increasingly powerful federal government be able to force the wealthy to pay for goods and to pay for goods and programs that served ordinary citizens and the poor? And thinking about how people make political decisions and choices, Buchanan concluded that you could only understand them as individuals seeking personal advantage. In an interview cited by McLean, the economist observed that in the 1950s, Americans commonly assumed, just assumed, that elected officials wanted to act in the public tr uh, interest. Buchanan vehemently disagreed. That was a belief he wanted, as he put it, to tear down. His ideas developed into a theory that became known as public choice. Buchanan's view of human nature was distinctly dismal. Adam Smith saw human beings as self-interested and hungry for personal power and material comfort, but he also acknowledged social instincts like compassion and fairness. Buchanan, in contrast, insisted that people were primarily driven by venal self-interest, period. Crediting people with altruism or a desire to serve others was romantic fantasy. Politicians and government workers were out for themselves. And so, for that matter, were teachers, doctors, and civil rights activists. They wanted to control others and wrest away their resources. Each person seeks mastery over a world of slaves, Buchanan wrote in his 1975 book, The Limits of Liberty. Does that sound like your kindergarten teacher? It did to Buchanan.
The people who needed protection were property owners, and their rights could only be secured through constitutional limits to prevent the majority of voters from encroaching on them. An idea Buchanan lays out in works like Property as a Guarantor of Liberty in 1993. McLean observes that Buchanan saw society as a cutthroat realm of makers, job creators and entrepreneurs, constantly under siege by takers. Autumn oh, parasites down there. <coughs> His own language. <laughs> was often more stark, warning the alleged prey of parasites and predators out to fleece them. In 1965, and you know what's funny? I think, I think George Carlin read, read, read into Buchanan. You know? Because when George Carlin would rant and rave about some of the, you know, when, when he would rant and rave about current events, Sometimes he would use these same words when, he, when he's lampooning them. Parasites and predators. He knew what was going on. In 1965, the Economist launched a center dedicated to his theories at the University of Virginia, which later relocated to George Mason University. McLean describes how he trained thinkers to push back against Brown versus Board of Education's decision to desegregate America's public schools and to challenge the constitutional perspectives and federal policy that enabled it. She notes that he took care to use economic and political precepts rather than overtly racial arguments to make his case, which nonetheless gave cover to racists who knew that Spelling out their prejudices would alienate the country. All the while, a ghost hovered in the background. That of John C. Calhoun of South Carolina, Senator and 7th Vice President of the United States. Calhoun was an intellectual and political powerhouse in the South from the 1820s until his death in 1850 expended his formidable energy to defend slavery. Calhoun, called the Marks of the Master Class by historian Richard Hofstadter, saw himself and his fellow Southern oligarchs as victims of the majority. Therefore, as McLean explains, he sought to create constitutional gadgets to constrict the operations of government. Economist Tyler Cohen and Alexander Tabarak, both of George Mason University, have noted that two men's affinities, heralding Calhoun, quote, a precursor of modern public choice theory, unquote, who anticipates Buchanan's thinking. McLean observes that both focused on how democracy constrains property owners and aim for ways to restrict the latitude of voters. She argues that unlike even the most property-friendly founders, Alexander Hamilton and James Madison, Buchanan wanted a private governing elite of corporate power that was wholly released from public accountability. He wanted a shadow government of oligarchs. A narrow band of oligarchs, unassailable and unaccountable to anyone. <coughs> Suppressing voting, challenging, uh, changing legislative processes so that a normal majority could no longer prevail. Sowing public distrust of government institutions. All of these were tactics toward the goal, but the Holy Grail was the Constitution. Alter it? And you could increase and secure the power of the wealthy in a way that no politician could ever challenge. What do you think would happen if the politicians themselves became the wealthy? Gravy train to oligarchy. McLean explains that Virginia's white elite and the pro-corporate president of the United, uh, University of Virginia, Colgate Darden, 
who had married into the DuPont family, found Buchanan's ideas to be spot on. In nurturing a new intelligentsia to commit to his values, Buchanan stated that he needed a gravy train, and with backers like Charles Koch and conservative foundations like the Scafey Family Charitable Trusts, others hopped on board. Money, Buchanan knew, can be a persuasive tool in academia. His circle of influence began to widen. McLean observes that the Virginia School, as Buchanan's brand of economic and political thinking is known, is a kind of cousin to the better-known market-oriented Chicago and Austrian schools. Proponents of all three were members of the Mont Pelerin Society, an international neoliberal organization which included Milton Friedman and Friedrich Hayek. But the Virginia School's focus and career missions were distinct. In an interview with the Institute for New Economic Thinking, the INET, McLean described Friedman and Buchanan as yin and yang. Quote, Friedman was this genial, personable character who loved to be in the limelight and made a sunny case for the free market and the freedom to choose and so forth. Buchanan was the dark side of this. He thought, okay, fine. They can make a case for the free market, but everybody knows that free markets have externalities and other problems. So he wanted to keep people from believing that government could be the alternative to those problems. And now the lights are going off, aren't they? The Virginia School also differs from other economic schools and a marked reliance on abstract theory rather than mathematics or empirical evidence that a Nobel Prize was awarded in 1986 to an econom economist who so determinedly bucked the academic trends of his day was nothing short of stunning, McLean observes. But then it was the peak of the Reagan era, an administration several of Buchanan's students had joined. Buchanan's school focused on public choice theory, later adding constitutional economics and a new field of law and economics to its core research and advocacy. The economist saw that his vision would never come to fruition by focusing on who rules. It was much better to focus on the rules themselves, and that required, quote, a constitutional revolution, unquote. McLean describes how the economist developed a grand project to train operatives to staff institutions funded by like-minded tycoons, most significantly Charles Koch himself, who became interested in his work in the 70s and sought the economist's input in promoting Austrian economics in the U.S. and in advising the Cato Institute, a libertarian think tank. Koch, whose mission was to save capitalists like himself from democracy, found the ultimate theoretical tool in the work of the Southern economists. The historian writes that Koch preferred Buchanan to Milton Friedman and his Chicago boys because, she quotes, quoting a libertarian insider, they wanted, quote, to make government work more, official, more efficiently when the true libertarian should be tearing it out at the root. <laughs> God, let me reread that. The historian writes that Koch preferred Buchanan and Milton Friedman because they wanted to make the government more efficient when the true libertarian should be tearing it out at its root. Wow. Huh. With Koch's money and enthusiasm, Buchanan's academic school evolved into something much bigger. By the 1990s, Koch realized that Buchanan's ideas, transmitted through stealth and deliberate deception, as McLean amply documents, oh, and never, ne never mind, never mind that this here constitutes the very 
fifth column that people like them fucking yammered about. They were telling us the truth all along, but they were projecting it on the other side. This is, that's, what, that's, that's what's hilarious and uh, sickening, sickeningly ironic about this article. Well, let's continue on here. With Koch's money and enthusiasm, Buchanan's academic school evolved into something much bigger. By 1990s, Koch realized that Buchanan's ideas, transmuted through stealth and deliberate deception and fifth columns, as McLean aptly documents, could help take government down to incremental assaults that the media would hardly notice. The tycoon knew that the project was extremely radical, even a revolution in governance, but he talked like a conservative to make his plan sound more palatable. McLean details how partnered with Koch, Buchanan's outpost at George Mason University was able to connect libertarian economists with right-wing political actors and supporters of corporations like Shell Oil, Exxon, Ford, IBM, Chase Manhattan Bank, and General Motors. Today, together, they could push economic ideas to the public through media, promote new curricula for economics educations, and court politicians in nearby Washington, D.C. At the 1997 50th anniversary of the Mont Pelerin Society, or Mont Pelerin, I guess, in case you pronounce it that way, McLean recounts that Buchanan and his associate, Henry Mann, a founding theorist of libertarian economic approaches to law, focused on such affronts to capitalists as environmentalism and public health and welfare, expressing eagerness to dismantle Social Security, Medicaid, and Medicare, as well as kill public education because it tended to foster community values. Feminism had to go too. The scholars considered it a socialist project. The oligarchic revolution unfolds. Buchanan's ideas began to have a huge impact, especially in America and in Britain. In his home country, The Economist was deeply involved in efforts to cut taxes on the wealthy in the 1970s and 1980s, and he advised proponents of the Reagan Revolution and their quest to unleash markets and posit government as the problem rather than the solution. The Koch-funded Virginia School uh, coached scholars, lawyers, politicians, and business people to apply stark right-wing perspectives on everything from deficits to taxes to school privatization. In Britain, Buchanan's work helped to inspire the public sector reforms of Margaret Thatcher and her political progeny. To put the suspect, oh boy, now this is an interesting paragraph. Listen to this. To put the success into perspective, McLean points to the fact that Henry Mann, whom Buchanan was instrumental in hiring, created legal programs for law professors and federal judges, which could boast that by 1990, two of every five sitting federal judges had participated. Quote, 40% of the U.S. federal judiciary unquote, White's McLean, had been treated to Coke-backed curriculum. Shit. 40% of the U.S. federal judiciary by 1990 had been doctrinated by coke hooked curriculum shit McLean illustrates that in South America Buchanan was able to first truly set his ideas in motion by helping a bare knuckles dictatorship ensure the permanence of a of much of the radical transformation it inflicted on the country that had been a beacon of social progress. Brace yourselves, folks. This is interesting right here, boy. The historian emphasizes 
that Buchanan's role in the disastrous Pinochet government of Chile has been underestimated partly because, unlike Milton Friedman, who advertised his activities openly with, you know, the sunny delivery and whatnot, Buchanan had the shrewdness to keep his involvement quiet. With his guidance, the military junta deployed public choice economics in the creation of a new constitution, which required balanced budgets and thereby prevented the government from spending to meet public needs. Supermajorities would be required for any changes of substance leaving the public little recourse to challenge programs like the privatization of social security. Let me reread that again. Because this is what happened to, with the Pinochet government. With Buchanan's guidance, the military junta deployed public choice economics in the creation of a new constitution which required balanced budgets, which prevented the government from spending to meet public needs, and a supermajority would be required for any changes of substance, leaving the public little recourse to challenge programs like the privatization of Social Security. Which political party has supermajorities in, in America? Are you still playing? But that's, that, just in case you're still playing the home game. And these and, and this party are called Democrats. This party are supposed to be the liberals. You know, Jimmy Dore is right. Democrats are a right-wing party. Always have been. They're the ones who need the supermajorities. Democrats are the ones that... Democrats and liberals are the people who abandon the right-wing party and left them to become a bunch of Bible-based idiots and fundamentalists so that they could concentrate their power and influence perpetually and indefinitely. Because part of their problem, part of, part of, their, part of their plan also was to use public education to dumb us down so that revolution and resurrection would be a thing of the past. The dictator's human rights abuses and pillages and pillage of the country's uh, resources did not seem to bother Buchanan, McLean argues, so long as the wealthy got their way. Despotism may be the only organizational alternative to the political structure that we observe, the economist had written in The Limits of Liberty. Yeah, this is Buchanan saying, we need despotism, man. I'd rather have that than anything else. If you've been wondering about the end result of the Virginia school philosophy, well, the economist helpfully spelled it out. Yep, he did. Give me despotism or give me death. A world of slaves. Most Americans haven't seen what's coming. McLean notes that when the Koch's control of the GOP kicked off in the high gear after the financial crisis of 2007 and 2008, many were so stunned by the shock and awe tactics of shutting down government, destroying labor unions, and rolling back services that meet citizens' basic necessities that even few uh, realized that many leading the charge had been trained in economics at Virginia institutions especially George Mason University. Wasn't it just a new political vicious wave of partisan politics? It wasn't. McLean convincingly illustrates that it was something far more disturbing. McLean is not the only scholar to sound the alarm that the country is experiencing a hostile takeover that is well on its way to radically and perhaps permanently altering the society. Peter, T Peter Tiemann, former head of the MIT Economics Department, Inet Grantee, and author of The Banishing Middle Class, as well as economist 
Gordon Laffer of the University of Oregon and author of The 1% Solution have provided eye-opening analyses of where America is headed and why. McLean adds another dimension to this dystopian big picture, acquainting us with what has been overlooked in the capitalists' uh, playbook. I'm not going to say right wing here because it's not right. Capitalists are both. They say, capitalists serve both parties. They say they are the oligarchy. Right wing and left wing, they all bat for the same team. She observes, for example, that many liberals had missed the point of strategies like privatization. <laughs> Bullshit. Efforts to reform. Oh, here we go. David Sorota, in case you haven't blocked me, I know you probably will now. <laughs> Efforts to reform public education and Social Security are not uh, just about a preference for the private sector over the public sector, she argues. You can wrap your head around those even if you don't agree. Instead, McLean contends, the goal of these strategies is to radically alter power relations, weakening pro-public forces and enhancing the lobbying power and commitment of the corporations that take over public services and resources, thus advancing the plans to dismantle democracy and make way for the return of the oligarchy. The majority will be held captive so that the wealthy can finally be free to do as they please, no matter how destructive. McLean argues that despite the rhetoric of Virginia school acolytes, shrinking big government is not really the point. The oligarchs require a government with tremendous new powers so that they can bypass the will of the people. See, right there. The oligarchs need a, big, uh, need a government big enough to shut us down and bypass us and make us obsolete. This, as McLean points out, requires greatly expanding police powers to control the resilient popular anger. The spreading use of preemption by GOP-controlled state legislators to suppress local progressive bickeries, such as living wage ordinances, is another example of the right's aggressive use of state power. Well, it's not just necessarily the rights. The right, the right, the right wing are not alone in this. Republicans, Republicans and Democrats are right wing parties. Could these right wing capitalists allow private companies to fill prisons with helpless citizens, or more profitable still, rightless, documented, undocumented immigrants? They could and have. Might they engineer a retirement crisis? by moving Americans to inadequate 4Ks? Done! Take, take away the rights of consumers and workers to bring grievances to court by naked, making them sign forced arbitration agreements? Check. Gut public, Asian, gut public education to the point where ordinary people have such bleak pros prospects that they have no energy to fight back? Get her done. Would they even refuse children clean water? Yes. McLean notes that in Flint, Michigan, Americans got a taste of what the emerging oligarchy would look like. And it tastes like poison water. And looks like Joe Biden celebrating the endorsement of uh, governor Wa uh, of the, the governor that poisoned Flint fucking douche there the coke funded Mackinac center pushed for legislation that would allow the governor to take control of communities facing emergency and put unelected managers in charge but for you know he, th this person couldn't do that until george w bush made it possible george w bush signed a law that said that low level state level employees can now uh uh could uh, use eminent domain and appoint emergency managers with signing statements and everything. George W. Bush did that. And, and, and Obama did nothing to stop it or, or curtail it. He made it better. It could be argued that he made these laws better. In Flint, 
one such manager switched the city's water supply to a polluted river. But the Mackinac Center's lobbyists ensured that the law was fortified by protections against lawsuits that poisoned inhabitants might bring. Kind of like the COVID vaccine all over again, right? Tens of thousands of children were exposed to lead, a substance known to cause serious health problems, including brain damage. Tyler Cohen has provided an economic justification for this kind of brutality, stating that where it is difficult to get clean water, private companies should take over and make people pay for it. This includes giving them the right to cut off people who don't or can't pay their bills, the economists explain. To many, this sounds grotesquely inhumane, but it is a way of thinking that has deep roots in America. In Why I, Too, Am Not a Conservative 2005, Buchanan considers the charge of heartlessness made against the kind of classic liberal that he took himself to be. McLean interprets his discussion to mean that people who fail to foresee and save money for their future needs are to be treated, as Buchanan put it, as subordinate members of the species, akin to animals who are dependent. Gee, that sounds vaguely familiar. I remember being told not too long ago that by a toxic boss that uh, I don't know what you're doing with your money, but uh, you need to save some of it. You make good money here. Huh, right. And... And uh, it, it, he <laughs> he insinuated that because people my age, and this is this is common around this is this is a common view under right wing douche kites, okay? Right wing libertarian, a and randian freaking idealists. They believe that people of a certain age, once they reach thirty, you know, over forty to fifty, once once they reach forty and into retirement and closer to 50 they should be say they should have a nest nest egg they should have a savings account it's a privileged fucking take a privilege take that has no basis in reality anymore because you don't want uh, <laughs> republicans and democrats don't want that they don't want us to have that you know for all this talk for all this talk about socialism and communism and whatnot, the biggest threat to capitalism and its and its dominion over us is a savings account. That's why my mom, my parents were born in the 30s and 40s. They were the last generation to have a fucking savings account of tens of thousands of dollars. This enabled them to say, take this job and shove it. That enabled them to, you know, weather any kind of storms and switch jobs and stuff like that. It gave them economic mobility. Oftentimes what is called upward economic mobility. They don't want that anymore. The ruling classes in this society, the toxic bosses and their enablers don't want that anymore. And haven't wanted that for some time. Do you, it's right here, let me reread this, okay? To many, this sounds grotesquely inhumane, but it is a way of thinking that has deep roots in America. Buchanan considers the charge of heartlessness made against the kind of classical liberal that he took himself to be. McLean interprets his discussion to mean that people who, quote, fail to foresee and save money for their future needs, quote, unquote, are to be treated as subordinate members of the species akin to animals who are dependent. Do you have your education, health care, and retirement personally funded against all possible exigencies? Then that means you. If you say no, that means you. Buchanan was not a dystopian novelist. He was a Nobel laureate. 
whose sinister logic exerts vast influence over America's trajectory. It is no wonder that Cohen, on his popular blog Marginal Revolution, does not mention Buchanan on a list of underrated individual libertarian thinkers. Though elsewhere on the blog, he expresses admiration for several of Buchanan's contributions and acknowledges that this Southern economist thought more, con more consistently in terms of rules of the games than perhaps any other economist. The rules of the game are now clear. Research like McLean's provide hope that toxic ideas like Buchanan's may finally begin to face public scrutiny. Yet, at this very moment, the Koch's state policy network and the American Legislative Exchange Council, known as ALEC, a group that connects corporate agents to conservative lawmakers to produce legislation, are involved in projects that the Trump-obsessed media hardly notices, like pumping money into state judicial races. Let's ignore Democrats who fund right-wing candidates like Quaylar. Let's forget all that, too. Their aim is to stack the legal deck against Americans in ways that McLean argues may be even bigger effects than Citizens United, the 2010 Supreme Court ruling which unleashed unlimited corporate spending on American politics. The goal is to create a judiciary, the goal is to create a judiciary that will interpret the Constitution in favor of corporations and only corporations and the wealthy in ways that Buchanan would have heartily approved. The United States is now at one of those historic folks, forks in the road whose outcome will prove to be fateful as those of the 1860s, the 1930s, and the 1960s, says McLean. To value liberty for the wealthy minority above all else and enshrine it in the nation's governing rules, as Calhoun and Buchanan both called for, and the Koch network is achieving, play by play, is to consent to an oligarchy and all but the outer husk of representative form. Nobody can say we weren't warned. And to David Sirota, who could be still watching this shit, you think this can be reformed? Smoke another bog, bitch. Let me scroll down here to a comment. Because there is a comment here. There's like 700 comments on or 100, 1,067 comments on this article. There is one comment that gets underplayed. Because they talk, it, it, it's it's a, an excellent comment. But when we, but, but when this, when discussions like the, the these happen, this part of the dynamic gets underplayed or not even mentioned at all. Let me see if I can find it here. Right here it is, Rebecca Gwynn. That's the one. Let me make the, now I'm going to make the text larger here. See, where are you? I must have passed it up. There it is right here. I'm going to make this a little bit. Oh, 150 might be too big. There we go. Right here. Let's read this one. This is a damn good comment. Hardly ever gets talked about. She says, I don't I don't think Apple H's coal miners in the company store gets enough play. Coal mines own these people economically. Life underground without light. One of my worst memories of childhood was going to my stepmother's relative's home. A trailer in the holler. Heat with coal that cling in that hollow without light. And the winter coal ash killing vegetation that the smoke didn't get. And miserable, relative, miserable relatives in their 40s or 50s hacking the cough of black lung. 
My own grandfather on my dad's side, I never met. He died in 1956 from black lung. I was born in 74. I had poor Alabama relatives that still used outdoor toilets, but their poverty and sharecropper history did not seem so depressing. They had gardens, fished, they had chickens, tar paper shacks, but life. The coal mining area was much worse. Sad, dirty, and dark. Yep. And a lot of what, what people don't realize, and, and I think it should be talked about, is if you're going to talk about the effects of capitalism and slavery, you also have to um, you also have to admit that white Appalachians were also slaves. Mountain men, mountain women, mountain families were also slaves, the coal miners. There's little difference in class and experience between a black slave on the plantation and a coal mo mo miner in the dirt. They have more in common than they'll ever disagree on. We were warned, and you know something? This article here from four years ago was talking about the right-wing Republicans as, as the Koch-funded bastards. Guess what? We know that the Democrats are a right-wing party now. Here we are four years later. And we didn't really need Jimmy Dore to point it out. It was, it was there under our freaking noses all along. And now on to the hodgepodge, folks. <sighs> this is from The Blaze. And again, this is a right-wing um, Republican news organization, The Blaze, uh, owned by Glenn Beck. But he comes up with this here. Joe Biden tells this bizarre story. <laughs> here we go. If I can inter just interject for a moment, my deceased son, Bo, he was the attorney general of the state of Delaware. And what he used to do is go down on the east side, the what called the bucket, highest crime rate in the country. There's a place where I used to, I was the only white guy that worked as a lifeguard down in that area, on the east side. And you know where the, you can always tell where the best basketball in the state is, and the best basketball in the city is. It's where everybody shows up. If I can... <laughs> And I respond, and my sorry leftist moon badass freak ass you used to think W was bad. Man, this guy is something else. Um, this is from Just a Thought. There is something uniquely disturbing about a sitting president telling half the country that they don't have access to the type of military equipment that the government does, and they better stay in line because their guns won't do much if it comes down to it. Right. Amen. Uh, this is a tweet I sent to Lumpy Louise. Uh, she didn't respond to it, but uh, 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 what was this? Uh, I tagged her with this. Oh, she tweeted something about, uh, oh, that's right, I, I now remember. I forgot to retweet it. Uh, Lumpy Louise said uh, she called she called Joe Biden, uh, Police State Joe, and I just come out with this gift. But I hadn't been Police State Joe. I'd been a health care a long time ago. It's no surprise for those in the know. That's why they voted for Police State Joe. Yeah, I won't quit my day job. <laughs> I don't even have a day job. Ooh, I'm fucking kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is sickening uh, this is Max Blumenthal Ukrainian Nazis at Disney World brought to you by the Pentagon with guest appearances by Darius Rucker of Hootie and the Blue Blowfish Flame 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 yes Flame and uh, John Stewart the Pentagon refuses to tell the gray zone if US taxpayers funded their travel and Sabby says, Darius Rucker from Hootie and the Bluefish, Blowfish actually attended this event. Americans are deeply propagandized. You know what's ridiculous? 
Is that him right there? That's not him. That's not Darius. Never mind. I was going to say, man, if that was him, if he was in the picture and he's halfway. Oh, my God. That, that's like that's like white power right there, ain't it? Right power, right, right power. That's halfway. That's halfway to Heil Hitler. What the fuck, Darius freaking Rucker, man. <sighs> Nina Turner comes out and just says unions, and I respond. She meant to add for me and mine, and none for thee and thine. But line noise made her twenty six hundred baud modem disconnect. God damn fool. And let's see, we got uh Savvy saying donate please donate for the tour for the poor. Here it is here. Uh in less than two weeks, tour for the poor will be delivering over eight hundred backpacks, school supplies, and the snacks to the children. If you can help out, show us the love and donate here. I'm gonna put uh, this in the description. Oh here, let me let me highlight it now. Cash app, yeah, PayPal and uh, this is for Rome and the tour for the poor. Make copy all that and oh boy, I need to open up my text document. Let me move this over a bit. If I can, get over. Shit, Ugh. my bo my box is getting small. I don't have my uh, my footer document open, so I want to paste this in here. <laughs> oh man, I did I wasn't prepared for today's show. You can tell. All right, let me shrink this up and get it resized. Here we are. Okay. <sighs> so I'll have this in the description. You got the tour for the poor going on. Uh, Professor Zenka says uh, Biden could have used a prime time speech to call out. Um... Hold on, my box is that big enough. There we go. I was getting some. And why is my windows? Taskbar showing up in the darn screen here. Hold up. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Biden could have used a primetime speech to call out the evil of how corporations hijack our democracy and make life unlivable for working class. Uh, uh, but our, ra our, our rage or raged against the fact that hundreds of thousands sleep on sidewalks and under bridges. Instead, he yelled at Trump supporters. <laughs> Yes. Blue Maga to the rescue. <laughs> oh, God. A shit lib comes in and says, <laughs> A shit lib comes in and says, he, may, he, he yelled at Maga fascists. He called for regional Republicans to join us. Join us in what? Maintaining the status quo? Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> Way to go, Professor. <laughs> and the Democrats on September 2nd, this was yesterday, said every single Republican Congress voted against lowering prescription drug prices. And I said, as long as Democrats can rely on the donor class and manufacture Republican scapegoats, they will never, ever, 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 ever bring Medicare for all up for a vote. It isn't going to happen. Uh, Jank Uger. Oh, God. What should tell you? This tells you everything, folks. As, as much as I freaking go after Jank <laughs> seven times on this goddamn show, he still hasn't blocked me because I can still see his tweets. Unlike uh, Anna Kasperi and all of them, and Dave Sirota, they blocked me. Jank is still there. Uh, Trump 100% tried to do a coup in America with fake electors and nearly got, nearly got his own vice president killed on an insane theory that one man could decide the election. 81% of Republican voters still love him, highest of any Republican. Don't tell me Republicans are normal. Professor Zinka says Democrats say that health care is a right, but didn't even try to pass Medicare for all in the middle of a deadly pandemic. One third of all deaths were due to our profit driven health care system. Don't tell me Democrats are normal. And and what Professor Zinka's left out. Is this little morsel right here. 
insane theory, an insane theory that one man could decide the election. You know what's another? You know what that's another theory? Uh, 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 you know what I call an insane theory? That one man or one person could decide the election? Vote blue no matter who. Notice he doesn't, he's not going to, yeah. We know where Jenks view on that's going to be. Your, your, your run vote matters. <laughs> Max Blumenthal, President Joe Biden. Oh, this here. Let me play the video and I'll shut up. I'll take a drink real quick. Let me get let me get my. I won't be doing this for much longer. I can't be doing the darn soft drinks. I'm gonna start drinking water and see if I can lose some weight here. But anyway, enjoy this freaking video. Um, I hope uh, I don't have echo here. Let me mute real quick and. Uh... And this is a nation that rejects violence as a political tool. We do not encourage violence. Then, when I was in your position, I was suggesting we bomb Belgrade. I was suggesting that we send American pilots in and blow up all the bridges on the Drina. I was suggesting we take out his oil supplies. I was suggesting very specific action. And, isn't and this is a nation. <laughs> Yeah, and Misty comes out and says, leader of the single most violent country ever on earth says that we don't encourage violence. How stupid do you have to be to fall for this? <sighs> right. Fucking God. Shit. Uh, Zana Day. Promoting imperialism by funding police and not health care. The speech had Trump vibes. Same message, different party. What is with this red and black shit? I'm the anarchist, not you, you fucking prick. What's the big idea? And we know what the big idea is. He's using this to adroitly try to project this idea that the people he's criticizing, the right-wingers he's criticizing, are anarchists. Shit. They, the, the, the left... Left shit libs always do that. <sighs> I'm not gonna play this. I am not gonna play this clip. It's seven minutes. I've already been I've been I've been going for two hours, over two hours now. <sighs> Compton J. Do you still believe in possible for the progressives to take over the Democratic Party? David Sorota, yes. I am tactically agnostic. Voting is not an experience of self-expression. Why don't you just kill yourself? This is everything he said in that seven-minute clip. Why doesn't he lead by example? If, there's, if David Sirota is all about the results, admits his life struggle hasn't produced results to the point of suggesting suicide, why is he blocking us like a narcissist instead of leading us in the mass suicide sweepstakes? Show us how it's done. Oh, Sir David of Sirota. Yeah. <laughs> Damn clown. Uh, interesting, says J.B. Font, and this is uh, right here. People in Naples are burning their energy bills and besiege the town hall. We don't pay the bills. Now it'll be chaos. In Naples, they don't joke around.
I wouldn't mind doing that. I like to do that to my lease. I'd like to do that to my electric bill, my internet bill. Shit. I'd love I'd love to do it. Fuck. <laughs> Bernie Sanders again. <laughs> oh, crap. Spitting venom's got me out. It caught me off guard with this. <laughs> the water boy. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> anyway, Bernie Sanders says the threats to our democracy could not... The threats to us in democracy could not be clearer... And we must act bold to protect it. <laughs> uh, Misty says uh, this guy had not one, but two elections rigged against his own party and said nothing. In fact, he went on to support, endorse, and stump for the people who did the rigging. And he's yet to speak on the persecution of Assange. So bold. <laughs> yeah. You know what? Hold on. <laughs> God damn. Oh, it's not there. There it is. Okay. <laughs> right there. The water boy. <laughs> and, uh, oh, wow. This is, this is an interesting one, folks. It's a minute long. Um, Full Nazi with Jon Stewart. Such an odd name for a show. Everyone knows you never go full Nazi. Even emotionally, it, it looks like the kind of psychic wound yeah. that a country is going to be hard. And I understand he's feeding them a whole nonsense of we're demilitarizing and denazifying. It, what was it? Denazification. Yeah. First of all, yeah. the guy who runs it is Jewish. Yeah. Like Zelensky's, he's, he's a Jewish guy. I don't, I don't, you going to denazify him? Is that what it's called now? The Department of Defense sponsored Warrior Games features liberal comedian Jon Stewart awarding a member of Ukraine's neo Nazi Azov Battalion at Disney World. But don't worry, his black sun tattoo was covered up when he received the award. I don't think, you know, it's not necessarily Jon Stewart's fault. To, you know, he didn't, I'm sure he didn't request. <laughs> Can you please send one of the Nazis over to receive this award? One Nazi, but please. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody knows you never go full Nazi. Nazi. <laughs> Even a mo <laughs> Oh, shit. And Jimmy Dore just said, yeah, I'm going to leave this right here. I didn't know Jon Stewart was so uninformed on Holy on Ukraine. Holy shit. <laughs> Turncoat Don. Me neither. I've been watching him so much. I was excited about his new show, but it ended up just being good fodder for satire. Yeah, full woke with Jon Stewart, the promo video. <laughs> full woke? There is a sense in the white community of which I have infiltrated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Y'all snuck quite in. successfully. In what, in what year? Point, You're welcome. Though. It was right after the Italians. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, They've mapped it out where, like, where people traveled from to go to to go to the insurrection event. Mm -hmm. um, where they traveled from? Soiree. <laughs> God, what is? Well, I'm actually, I'm actually, because Kay, every now and then I, I go, I would love to hear Cornell say, now, Brother John, Brother John, Brother John. <laughs> We're going to do the problem with black people well, at some whether, point. We called whether, it. Yeah. <laughs> the Irish became the cops. The Italians oh, opened no. up the pizza places. And we were like, anyone want a nosh? This <laughs> had populations where um, people of color uh, went up in their populations. And then you can track, like, and then all these people were like, well, I got to go shit in the White House. <laughs> <laughs> one in five, one in so five. was it Ross, Rachel, Chandler? <laughs> <laughs> you, all, you already know at the end of this episode, Cornell West is going to watch it and be like, no Miss Calls? Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. He's on my list. He's on my list. <laughs> oh, yes. I feel like the collaborative process at the show really helps to calibrate not a dogma or an orthodoxy, but a 
a thought process. <laughs> it wasn't my baby Monica. Please, not Monica. <laughs> <laughs> it can't be. That is crazy. Boy, that was cringe. <laughs> What don't you get? They woke. Woke. Boy, this comment says it all. From Will Hobson and the Oregon Libertarian Podcast. Jimmy Dore is officially the new John Stewart now. Yep. Uh, if George Carlin was alive today, he would say, Hey, Corky, uh, you know, uh, you know when I told you that, uh, you had you you were going to be the comedian that shows the way. Eh, forget it. I was wrong. That's that's Jimmy Dore. <clears throat> Sorry, I got a sore throat. So the the Carlin voice is kind of fucked right now. Speaking of fucked, let's keep going. we we know how fucked we are, and 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 and, and then we got the Ukraines getting fucked. It's hysterical. This is Fiorilla Isabel. It's hysterical how those okay with funding Nazis in Ukraine say they don't have a Nazi problem and it's only a few people in spite of thousands of crimes against humanity committed by these factions are the same morons blanket labeling a large sector of the U.S. public as fascists. The attack on MAGA is an attack on MAGA. It's as much of an attack on any dissenting opinion on the establishment narrative. They're the bait. Anyone challenging the status quo with actual opposing facts and beliefs will be censored and attacked. But especially anti-imperialist voices. And right here, not uh, 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 Ahmed Misty. Fam, there wasn't there was a single Nazi flag spotted at the trucker protest in Canada. This was in Canada. And that was enough for them to demonetize to demonize and discount the entire movement. These aren't the deepest of thinkers. Right. Right on. Ah, uh, boy. Yeah, more Joe Biden. Here we go. This is uh, Matt Taibbi. Biden's handlers had the otherwise inspiring setting of Philadelphia's Independence Hall bathed in so much blood red light. He looked like an opening act for Queensryche or Rammstein. <sighs> This is an article of Matt Tabibi's, uh, bring, Biden brings the war home on Substack. Oh, uh, crap. You got to subscribe. Damn. Well, so much for that, Matt. <sighs> Man, that sucks. Oh, shit. Damn it. Hold up. Let me bring that there. Let me bring that link back if I can. There we go. And uh, I, I, uh, and it's weird. It's right there. And this is the last thing I wanted to bring to your uh, uh, attention here. One of the last things. Uh, Jason Orton says, uh, still true. Make sure to boil the water, Mississippi. Uh, Biden, when other countries need help. All that cash. Biden, when Americans need help. Nothing there. And lastly, reality extremes. I want to end it on the unemployment uh, stuff because of what's going on. And I started with unemployment and uh, that story. Uh, the frustration that comes with being unemployed. Everyone just thinks you're chilling. Yeah, they do. I mean, they think that they think that we're having fun here. I think it's weird. They think that this shit is fun and we're just sitting around and playing our uh, on our uh, consoles all day and whatever and catching up on our Steam log. But truth be told, we sit here in fucking frustration. And every few minutes we think back. We look back and think about where, you know, where am I going to get this? Where am I going to afford this? And we just shake our heads like it's like... It is you get the you 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 get this attitude like it is what it is. I, I can't stay I can't change it or stop it. But anyway, thank you for enjoying me. If you got to this far, my first two hour and fifteen minute freaking show. Wow, I didn't expect it to be this long. Hmm. And if you stuck around all the way to the end, thank you.
seriously thank you it's very hard to hold your attention for 20 minutes let alone two hours so if you did so if you stuck around this long whether it be 20 minutes or two hours thank you kindly for your visits um please follow the links in the description below uh, there's a link to my patreon if you want to help me out and support me in any way shape or form uh last i checked I still only have two subscribers, and uh, let me go. Let me show you something here, if I can. Let me go back and transition back to my browser. Let me show you. Um, I think I talk. I think I talked about this. I think I talked this in my into a, about a video. Um, let me show you how many subscribers I got now because uh, yeah, I lost subscribers. I lost a few subscribers ever since my appearance on the Sabby Sabs though show. And it kind of it kind of sucks, but uh, I would rather have um and that's in the last 28 days, okay? Look at this. We're only 2 days this is September 3rd. I'm 3 we're 3 days into September and I already and I lost one subscriber. I lost one subscriber, okay? Now, um, let me show the last 90 days. I lost two more. So, yeah. Um, I lost a few subscribers when I uh, talked about the Culver situation on Savvy Show. And uh, I didn't, uh, they haven't been replaced. Um, this is my first video in quite some time. Let me uh, double check the dashboard here. Um, update on MDCR. I uploaded this on the 27th of August. So it's been a good a week or two before I, uh, since I published anything. I'm focused on trying to find work here, folks. Um, and uh, I got to start paying the bills here and find another uh, uh, line of work. And as a result, um, I'm not uh, all that concerned with Taganzo Media and, and, and cooking out content. Like I said, this is like the first video in quite some time. And I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, until next time, folks, uh, this has been a Corrupted Pulse Show. Taganzo Media, thanks for watching.